Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Book of Luke, the light giver. And all how much light is shed from the very words of this um, concise report by a physician, which Luke was, a medical doctor, in giving us an account of exactly how it was. We know that both Elizabeth and Mary now, after the conception, that we have what a fantastic time that for Elizabeth it seemed like a little late because she was quite along in years, but for Mary it was a little early because she was not to the the she was betrothed but not married and but the angel Gabriel appeared, and inasmuch as the two were cousins, and that's important because Elizabeth being of the daughters of Aaron and Mary being um, of the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Levite because of her mother being a Levite and her father a Judean of the tribe of Judah, then we see the, the order of Melchizedek kept forth in as much as Christ would be legally and by birth a king of kings and lord of lords the king line, Judah, and the priest line being the Levites. Mary has just approached Elizabeth, and as she approached, this would be December the 25th from the course of Abiah, which is a date in the chapter 1, first lecture. Then the babe who was six months in Elizabeth's womb leapt, meaning the Holy Spirit was already there at conception. That's when the soul begins dwelling in the very womb of the mother, and so it is. So that's what had just happened as Mary approached her cousin Elizabeth. Let's pick it up in verse 42, and here we have um, uh, Elizabeth uh, speaking, verse 42, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, speaking of Mary, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Why? Verse 43, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to my house? And we see the humbleness here of uh, Elizabeth um, and verse 44. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Not, not for sadness, but for joy. In other words, the very presence of the Holy Spirit already dwelling with man. That's why you can celebrate uh, December the 25th. That's when Christ, in fact, indeed, through the Holy Spirit, began dwelling with man and brought this wonderful joy present at that time. Verse 45, And blessed or happy is she that believed... For there shall be a performance, a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. From the Lord, who? how did she get that word from the Lord? The man that stands before the Lord, which is to say Gabriel, being translated means man of God. Verse 46, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Oh, how I love him, how I appreciate him, is what she's saying here. Verse 47, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. And here, here we have in her womb that Savior that God promised and he delivered upon it. And that Savior would become he who was crucified that paid the price for salvation for whomsoever will. It happened and it was a joyful time. Verse 48, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And, 
And it was blessed. Why? Because this was the fulfillment of what was said concerning Eve all the way back to the eighth day uh, of the creation of, uh, of, of uh, Eth Ha'adam, that day, when it would be said there that Eve would be the mother of all living. Not, the, not that she gave birth to all that were living, but that through her womb, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, all the way to this Mary, would come the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of the world. And quite frankly, you are either in him or you're not living, because this living means eternal. You would have eternal life if you were to love him, believe upon him, and then thus um, so it is that we have uh, all generations, all the way back to Eve, we have this blessing, this promise from Almighty God. And the promise, actually the first prophecy in the Bible, you will find in chapter 3, verse 15, where it speaks of the serpent seed and the woman's seed, the woman's seed being Christ ultimately. He said, you're going to bruise his heel, meaning you're going to nail him to the cross, but he's going to bruise your head, and ultimately that's what it will be when Satan is cast into the lake of fire. Verse 49 to continue. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And so it is, the Most High God, having seen fit through this young girl to bring forth this Savior. Verse 50, And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Don't, many might say, well, how could this be possible? Well, Remember verse 30, 37. Don't ever forget it. 37 of this same chapter. What did it say? For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Our Father is able to do whatsoever He so chooses. There's no reason ever for anyone that loves Him and follows Him to get all anxious about anything, knowing Father's wing is over you when you are indeed following him and serving him. Verse 51, to continue. Verse 51 reads, He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He'll let them do it to themselves. They won't have any trouble doing it. Verse 52, He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. And so it is that he would, well, uh, tell us an example of that. Well, one of the greatest examples would be Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I mean, he was so mighty and God knocked him down and had him, had him acting like an animal for four seasons passed over. And he took a little old Daniel, who was a captive, and put him basically over the management of the whole realm, and in other words, moved him from the low degree in prison up to controlling the nation, the high seat, and Nebuchadnezzar to the low, and what happened? The conversion then of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 of the great book of Daniel wrote one of the most beautiful prayers ever written. I'm talking about the king of Babylon, not the one that is to come, which is to say none other than Satan, but God can manage whatever he wishes to do. People like to play government and politics. God's on the throne. Verse 53. He had filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. In other words, he has, he, uh, what, is he, what is the good things he fills uh, the hungry with? Truth. Truth being the word of God, he fills you and gives you that strength and that power and that might that God's word brings you, strengthens you, and shows you with that light being Luke, the light giver, showing you the path and the way. Verse 54, he hath, he hath hope in his servant Israel. He has helped um, in remembrance of his mercy. This is... Um, 
this word hope and uh, translated from the Greek, it means that he re actually takes their hand and leads them, leads them on the way. How precious it is that God loves his children to that point. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been in one of those fixes where you didn't know which way was out and God simply just took you by the hand, basically, spiritually, and led you through it and you wondered, well, what was I so upset about that he worked it out for you? That's the way our Father operates. Um, verse 55. As he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Well, what did he, you know, it's important that you, why would God mention Abraham here? Well, because of the promise made. And uh, you're not going to have it, but I'm, I'm going to go back to the 17th chapter of Genesis. When Abram was still Abram, and when God actually changed his name. Listen to it a moment. Chapter 17, verse 5, the great book of Genesis. What was it that God said to Abraham? Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. He added a ha, which is to say an H, the fifth letter of the alphabet, meaning grace. Uh, and uh, for a father of many nations have I made thee. That's what the word Abraham means, father of many nations. That was the promise made to Abraham. And I will take the exceedingly, I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee. And kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And so it was. That's how it God spoke to Abraham. It's a covenant. A covenant is a contract. And that contract is to all nations, whomsoever will. Through what? Through this babe in Mary's womb at this time. It comes to pass that here is that leader here is that Messiah. Here is that one. This is why Abram was changed to Abraham, because through this son, the son of God, it would be made possible. Verse 56, returning to Luke chapter 1. And, and Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now, let's see. Let's figure this out. Get your pencil out. When, how far along was Elizabeth when Mary first came there? She was six months. And that was December the 25th. We're three months later. That's nine months for Elizabeth. We're about to see the birth of John the Baptist. Well, when was he born then? Well, figure it out. December the 25th. January the 25th, February the 25th, March the 25th, or that is to say just about the time of the spring equinox, which was the announcing just a few days from Passover, when that one would cry, that one would be born who would cry in the wilderness. You see, all these things are not by accident, but by the wonderful hand of the living God that he lays this groundwork whereby we know so here Elizabeth, being in her ninth month, is going to deliver. Verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. 58. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. There she had been barren all these years. And then was blessed with this child. Verse 59, And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. This would put you to Passover. Okay. The 15th day after the spring equinox. And they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. That's what they called him. It won't stand. Okay. Verse 60, And his mother answered and said, not so, but he shall be called 
John, Johannan, which is to say gift of God. And here indeed was to this senior couple a gift from God. But not only that, a gift, a voice crying from the wilderness that would announce the coming of the Lord himself and crying repent to, to many and delivering their souls. Uh, what a fantastic uh, one this was. Uh, but here, Zechariah still can't speak because he doubted the, uh, the angel Gabriel. He doubted the very, being a, a priest of the course of Abiah would doubt Gabriel, the man that stands before the very altar of God. And so he couldn't talk. Verse 61, And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. You don't have any Johns in your family. Verse 62, And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. 63, And he asked for a writing table. This will be the first time writing is brought up in, in this, uh, this particular book. And he wrote, saying, his name is John. And they marveled all. And here you have the first written word, absolutely, that would announce the dispensation. What was that name written? John, Johannan. What does it mean? The grace of Almighty God, the grace of Yahweh, to be more specific. And so it was that this was all set in motion by God himself, by divine order. Well, wonder why he would do it, because he loves you. He loves you enough that he provided a Savior, because you're sure not perfect. But he, through this Savior, and this one that would cry from the wilderness, he provided this way forever, this covenant, this contract, that it would be honestly fulfilled, and kept for mankind, even to this day, and will be throughout eternity. Verse 64, to continue, And his mouth was opened immediately, Zacharias was, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. He had indeed been blessed. Verse 65, And fear came on all that dwelt round, that's reverence, all around about them. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. What a blessing it was. 66, And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And so it was. Christ himself would later talk about this John. He would say, what did you go out there to hear? Some reed blowing in the wind? Listen to somebody 20 minutes this away and then switch over the wind this way and listen there 20, but never giving to the truth. No, John was straight on with the truth. Repent. And never giving quarter to anything other than truth itself. What a John. He said, you didn't go out there to hear some man dressed in fine clothing. You went out there to hear John. And so it was that this one would lead. 67, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied saying, now this is a prophecy direct from the Holy Spirit. Listen, 68, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he hath visited and redeemed his people. He has give, brought in a new dispensation of time. It's called the time of salvation. To repent and have your sins forgiven. Verse 69. And hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Now, uh, again, um, we know that, um, that uh, Zacharias was a Levite. So how is it that um, he's saying from the house of David, he's talking about David and the horn and the promise that would come with the team that both of them would make. 
that is to say, the Lord Jesus Christ and John. 70, and he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets. This is a prophecy. Which have been since the world began. In other words, this was determined before the world, the foundations of this earth age ever came into being. It was formed from the very first earth age when, when sal salvation was needed. And um, uh, naturally, this one was in the spirit of Elijah. And, and these things, the Savior himself brought forth or promised by Almighty God being the whole purpose of this dispensation of time, the time of salvation, the time of testing in a sense to see who will love God and who will follow Satan. The choice is always up to the individual. Verse 71 that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. And that is as it is. If you love the Lord, and if you follow his word, and if you use the wisdom that he grants you through serving him, it will give you the victory over all those that hate you. Why? Because God will see to it. That's his promise. Do you believe that? You can, because it is true. But you must at the same time be a follower. You can't doubt as Zacharias did when Gabriel approached him in the beginning. You have to believe the prophecy that Zechariah is giving right now. For it's not Zechariah speaking, but it's the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit that was still in the womb of Mary, bringing forth salvation to the world. Verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, that covenant that we read in the 17th chapter of Genesis. But what he's quoting here is Micah chapter 7, verse 20, where this prophecy was brought forth again and, and nailed down that he would always lead us. You know, at this time, you want to remember also that our father, as he would bring forth this son who would pay that price on the cross, gives us the full reason thereof. God always does. It was even written in Psalms 22, which is the psalm of the crucifixion. It's telling how they crucified Christ. It was, gives Christ words on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane. And, and in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, in that 22nd Psalm, it says, you will announce this to the congregation. And that congregation is told in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Christ came into this world to be crucified, basically, whereby in so doing, he could bring in salvation, but at the same time, destroy death, which is to say the devil. And so it is that he does and did and will. And through that comes your salvation. Why, why do I say that? Because I want you to know that he takes care of business. That's why the very scripture ahead that said he, he um, from the hand of all that hate thee, he's in charge. He's in control. And he puts down those that would come against us. He puts down our enemies. And you can love him and trust him for that. That's the beauty of salvation. That is the beauty of the gift that God would send us. Verse 73 to continue. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham. That oath is a covenant. It holds true to this day that Abraham would become the father of many nations through this son, Christ. That, that um, his seed, his offspring, would become as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. Where are they today? Basically, they make up your free nations, the free nations of this world. Well, why, why free? 
Well, because God's children will not stay under captivity for a long period of time. Why? Because God demands freedom. God demands it, and the children arrange it. But that is the promise made to Abraham. It is a contract and a covenant, and it is as sure today as, as it was the first day he gave it. Verse 74. And he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. You don't have anything to worry about. You know, when, when you look at the troubled world, you, you should always think of at this time Psalms 2. Oh, how the heathen do rage. Why do they rage? Because they're ignorant. Atheist, communistic atheism around the world. They have no anchor, no way to go, nothing to anchor things on. And then it continues in that Psalms 2 and lets us know that God laughs at it because he would send this son. I think I feel led just to turn there. You're, you're not going to have it. It wasn't planned, but I think I'm going to read just a little bit of that psalm that, uh, that you have to know because in these troubled times, you, you can worry if you allow yourself, but God has promised you you don't have to. And Psalms... Two, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing, a bunch of emptiness? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Let's just take them over and do things the way we want to, politically, religiously, ed with education and everything else. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. You think our Father doesn't laugh at the idiocy of people? The Lord shall have them in derision. And boy, look at them. Talk about derision. They, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And that king is none other than Christ himself. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And that begetting was, was uh, in the process just a while from delivery where we left that chapter 1 in Luke. Ask me, and I shall give thee the heathen, for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and Christ will. And thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoicing and with trembling. Kiss the Son. That means love the Lord Jesus Christ lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled. But a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Do you do that? You can put your trust in him. He's going to destroy death, which is to say the devil. And even as the heathen rage today, God's laughing because he has assured you that follow him, hey, don't sweat it. We got it well under control. We're in the end times, and time marches on. Returning then to St. Luke chapter 1, let's go with the next verse. 75. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of his life. That is every day. He doesn't take a day off. He doesn't just come on one day of the week. Every day in the Lord is a wonderful day. 76. And thou child. We're back to, to John the Baptist. Shall be called the prophet of the highest, the most high God. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Repent. Verse 77. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. That's all you have to do. Let him know you love him and repent. Have a change of mind to know what he has done for us. 
78, through the tender mercies of our God, and oh, they're there, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Um, you know, this day spring is a beautiful word. In, in the Hebrew, it's shemak, is a mak, rather. It means the branch. And that branch is Christ. And that branch is coming. It's signed in the heavens. Verse 79. The, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace of mind. So that even though the heathen rage, you find that peace of mind to know our Father is on the throne and to know that all is well. Verse 80 to complete the chapter. And the child grew, this being John, and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. And there he was, always uh, able, a can-do type person. Why? God had his hand on him. Just as you become a can-do type person today, when God has his hand on you, he can count on you. You bet he can if you follow him, if you love him. And to know God didn't do this because he needed some space to fill or time to fill. He did it for you so that salvation could come into your heart. Why? He loves you. He did all these things so that you could have that salvation. And he sent this one to prepare the way, though they beheaded him. Yet again, that spirit of Elijah shall come to prepare the hearts of the children to the fathers, plural, the bad and the good. You follow the good father, our heavenly father. You'll never regret it, and you'll never go wrong. Why? Because he dispenses that love he has for you, that it flows over into your life. And this light, this light giver, that day star, Zemach, the branch, is with us. Do you not know that even while he was in the mother's womb, he could affect and give messages such as he gave to Zacharias? Uh, what make you think he can't today? Of course he can. That's the beauty and the part of serving him. Don't miss the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Hey, number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. The spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. We have one judge, that's our father. Leave the judging to him. You do the discerning. That's a gift from God is to know what's right and what's wrong, and follow likewise. Our Father always blesses that. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, prayer request, don't need the number, don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. The Holy Spirit does. He witnesses to you His very presence when He touches you. So let him know you love him. That's what he wants from you. Even today, let him know, won't you? He loves you. He may not love what you do all the time. Repent and return that love and be blessed. Father, around the globe, we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch.
in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. And we're going to go with David from Oklahoma. If a person refuses to be baptized, will he lose the rewards of heaven? In a sense, you're asking me to judge a person by <clears throat> the term refuses to be baptized. Is it that, you see, as a pastor, did he really refuse with full knowledge of what baptism was? Or did he simply not know what baptism was and with, because of his lack of understanding, he um, did not accomplish it? So you see, it makes a big difference, and so we're not supposed to judge. Now, we, we do know one thing. We know that on the day of the crucifixion, that there were two malefactors on each side of Christ. One of them converted while nailed to that cross. He did not come down, become baptized, and overcome. But yet, the Lord Jesus Christ promised him, there, faithfully. This day, that same day, I will see you in paradise. He overcame and he was not baptized. So it is not man's right to judge anyone. You see, we don't know what they were truly thinking or, or what the equation was of plus or minus, but he does. God does. That's why we leave that type of judgment as to who overcomes into heaven in the hands of Almighty God. Crystal from Arizona. I need scripture about Cain and Abel being twins. Okay, you're going to have to go into the Hebrew a little bit. I hope you have a strong concordance. And you will find in chapter 4 of the great book of Genesis, verse 1, that Eve had conceived and bare one son and named him Cain. And then in verse 2, it says... And again, but that word again in the Hebrew is yasthap, yasthap, which means what? Not again, she continued. If a woman is in labor and gives birth to a child and then continues in labor and gives birth to another child, what does that mean? It means they're twins. Plus the fact, did not they both come to the age of accountability to sacrifice to Almighty God in the same year? Abel's, Abel's offering sacrifice was well received. Cain's was refused. Why? They were both twins. They both became of age at the same time. That's your scripture, and so it is. Esther from California. I want to know how many times you forgive someone. Well, Matthew 18, 22. Make a note of it. Matthew chapter 18, verse 22. <clears throat> if someone, excuse me, if someone uh, really honestly repents to you and asks forgiveness, then Christ says forgive them seven times 70 there in Matthew chapter 18. Seven times seven, that's 490 times. If they, but they must honestly repent to you and ask forgiveness. Otherwise, if they don't repent to you, then I always recommend that you, without saying it to them, forgive and get it out of your system anyway, else it will fester and, and give you trouble, not them. So... Um, ignorance is bliss, so you can you can forgive ignorance because they don't know any better. Edith from Florida. When I pray, I say Father, and sometimes I pray to Jesus. Which which one is correct? Well, Jesus told us exactly how to do everything. Basically, he gave us an example. <clears throat> they asked him, "How do we pray?" And he said, "You will pray, our Father." which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so it will be. Christ is coming to earth and it's going to be heaven right here. But who, who did he say to pray to? Our Father. But always pray to the Father. But always pray and ask in Christ's name. 
because that gives credentials that you are a Christian believer. And you see, in actuality, let's get right down where the rubber meets the road, because if you know the truth, you know that if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father also. And though you are following the proper chain of command, I will use that terminology, you are still praying to one Father. And so it is. Glenn from Idaho. Mark chapter 12 through 25, can you please explain this? No marriage in heaven because why? Because we are all as the angels. But yet there is a marriage. You can read of it in, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 and 7. Uh, that um, It's the marriage to the Lamb. In spiritual bodies, sometimes you do not quite understand what you're talking about. Christ, um, having... Uh, been brought was brought forth as a savior, but at the same time, when this particular dispensation of time began, God created man and woman and told them to replenish the earth. That means populated again. It was a populated in the first earth age. Redo it, and that's why that we have male and female today was to bring forth each soul born innocent of woman to make his or her mind up whether they're going to love Almighty God or follow Satan. That's, uh, that's why it is. But then when this earth age is over with, we're in spiritual bodies. And you do not bring forth children in spiritual bodies. Dwayne from Michigan, in the end when Jesus makes the second coming, what happens to everyone left on earth? Uh, do you understand that Christ is coming here to earth to establish the kingdom, the Millennium Temple? We just covered it in the great book of Ezekiel. So what happens to people here on earth is exactly what the book of Ezekiel declares. Some are, will have and some will have not have overcome. We will teach those that didn't make it who deserve an opportunity and um, <clears throat> they will have a uh, an opportunity to participate in either the second resurrection or the second death. The choice will be strictly theirs. There will be, during that time, no handicapped people, no people that don't understand, because everybody will have the ability for 100% recall, and they will be taught well for a thousand years in spiritual bodies where they have no hang-ups, with Satan totally and completely chained away, locked, even spiritually, whereby they have the opportunity to learn, they will either take part in the second resurrection or the second death. It's their choice. Whitney from Oklahoma, I need scripture to prove that Christ is perfect and did not sin. I need to prove this to my husband. Well, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 documents that you should be perfect because God is perfect, and when you've seen God, you've seen the Son, and when you've seen the Son, you've seen God. He was the offering, the sin offering without blemish. That means with no sin. Why? Because he was perfect. I think maybe if you would take your strong concordance and show your husband that the word perfect uh, even aside from, I'm, I feel this might be something uh, that he would be better, uh, have, have a better understanding if he understood the word, word in the Greek. But the word to be perfect means to be mature. We all fall short. Christ didn't. He was perfect. That's why he could be the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice for one and all times. But we must mature. That means stop thinking as a child and get real serious about following God. Take your Strong's Concordance, take the word perfect, break it back to the Greek, and let him read it. Kay from South Carolina. I believe in God and try to understand his word. I am surrounded by very religious people, and I feel as if God expects me to understand as they do. I try to study and know the Bible, but I still will I still get to heaven if I am not as knowledgeable 
but I know the basics so far. The simplicity in which Christ teaches is what you want to hang on to. You've got many higher critics in the world. And the higher critics are ratchet jaws that go on and on and on. And many times, though they claim to be ever so knowledgeable, their knowledge, of, their knowledge pertains to critiquing to the point that they almost destroy with their traditions the Word of God. So as long as you understand the basics, which is the truth, then you're in good shape. You see, understand this, um, okay. True wisdom is to take that that is complicated and simplify it in a language whereby everybody can understand simply. That is true wisdom. You've got it. You hang tough. Don't let somebody rob you of that. Lynn from Arkansas. When you speak of being in the last generation, what does this mean? Well, it means the generation of the fig tree. Mark chapter 13, read it for yourself. Christ said, learn the parable of the fig tree because when you see it come to pass, this generation will not pass until all prophecy is fulfilled, meaning it's the last one. It began in the year of our Lord, 1948, when you have knowledge of the parable of the fig tree. Uh, Jane from Arkansas, when you say the two tribes aren't together, yet who are you referring to? What are the two tribes? Where, where does Israel fit in? Well, you're, you're misunderstanding. I didn't say the two tribes. I said the two houses. You have the house of Israel and you have the house of Judah. Not, not, two, you, not two different tribes, two different houses. Because one house, the house of Israel, has ten tribes in it. And the house of Judah has two tribes in it. So don't confuse tribes with houses. Those houses were split they, why, way back by the Assyrian who took the ten northern tribes captive 200 years before Judah that other, and the other tribe went into captivity, uh, which uh, they would uh, go into captivity about 400 B.C. and so forth. So they were split, and they still are, until they go back together. Many people try to put all of Israel into one tribe, the tribe of Judah. There were 12 tribes. That won't fly, and you would never understand God's word if you tried to do that. Uh, Delilah from Texas. My question is, will the U.S. dollar be worth anything in the near future? Of course it will. The only time that money will change is after the false Christ returns and one worldism comes into being. At that time, there will be a money change. Now, it is true that the dollar has lost some value. And, um, and so it is. It's like many people had 401ks, and I mean, when she went down, a lot of people got scared at the bottom and began to get rid of their 401ks, which was a sad mistake, because what has happened? Basically, most of them have covered, recovered. They're back up again. Not that they've made a whole lot, but just ride easy. God's on the throne. Everything's under control, and if you love him, everything's going to be well as long as you use this. Betty from uh, Louisiana. I believe people reap what they sow. Is this true? Absolutely. <clears throat> you reap what you sow. You know, uh, and I understand what you're saying about a friend who kind of thinks they can do what they want and God will let them get away with it. If God loves you, he's going he's to chastise you. And if you're doing something wrong, he loves you, he's going to thump your gourd. And he's going to thump it good. The more you continue into that way, the harder he will thump your gourd to get your attention. And finally, you want to get around to saying, Father, I've got it. I understand. I'm going, to, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to get it done to help my brethren and to help the people of the world and try to, try to um, be a better servant. That's, that's you see, God loves his family, and he, he takes care of his family. 
he will, if he loves you, he will thump your gourd, okay, uh, if you do something wrong, that is. Gra Craig from Nevada, Pastor Murray, thank you for your, t you're welcome. Do you think the one world money will have in God we trust? It probably will because he pretends to be God. Uh, that, that is to say the false Messiah, he's Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. He sits in the holy place claiming the temple of God, claiming to be God. So he's going to say, you can trust me and trust in God. He's going to play God. But it won't be our father, okay? So uh, whichever. There will be far more important things for us to be watching at that time in witnessing against that false one. Uh, Rhonda from Kentucky. In the book of Job, how long do you think was the span of time that God allowed Satan to test Job until all was restored to Job? Thanks for your teaching the word and continued blessings. Well, he sure does. He blesses us good. Um, it, it, is, um, it is written that um, when, when things were restored, Job was about 70. <clears throat> the... The troubles lasted 21 years. So 21 from 70 would be 49. It, was, it all came apart on him when he was 49 years old. And, and um, it was restored at 70. But do you know what? He lived 100, as it's written in the 48th, 48th chapter of Job, he lived 140 years after that which would make him about 210 years old or what have you, all right? 21 years is how long it took from, to, to correct it. Ramona from New Mexico, question, will there be male and female in the spirit body and how old will we be? We will, th there will not be male and female as we think of it today. We will all be as young adults. Why? Because age doesn't mean anything in a spiritual body. Age has not one iota to do with the spirit body from the day that God created it in the first earth age all the way through this earth age and into the eternity. Age just simply does not uh, affect um, uh, the spiritual body. That's why it's eternal. Uh, Lewis from Florida, I'm glad you enjoy studying, but when I study God's Word alone, I can't remember later what I have read. What should I do, and will God hold it against me? No, not, not necessarily. You, you probably remember more than, um, than what you think you do, and naturally, when you're studying, um, as you say, I enjoy studying with you every day, uh, but, but, and you do retrain more if you go a little more into the simplicity of God's teaching, it simplifies it. And that's why that you have a little better memory of it. But um, this is why I really encourage people to use a strong concordance. If you don't quite understand a thing, check it back to the Greek and the Hebrew or the Aramaic, whichever the case may be, and you'll have a better understanding. But God doesn't, he does not expect all of us to have 100% recall. It just doesn't work that way. And, um, uh, and so many times as teachers, God gives gifts of, of good recall, but there's for a purpose for it. It's to share. Those that God gives much, boy, he expects much, and they'd better do it. Karen from Pennsylvania. Where in the Bible can I find the scripture that will dispute the rapture so I can show someone that the rapture is wrong? Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 20 through 25. If you have a standard King James, you get one of these new things, and they've changed it to birds flying. But what it says is, in, in the Hebrew manuscripts, is that the daughters of Jerusalem, or those that should be teaching truth, sew kerchiefs to put over every knuckle in God's outreach saving arms to save people and camouflage it and try to teach people to fly to save their souls. Uh, he's against it, he says. And also, um, 
it's, it is simply a fact that God has worked for his elect against the false Christ, as Mark 13 states. You know, for a person that knows better, if they don't witness against the false Christ when he comes to say, I've come to fly you out of here, that's almost the unpardonable sin. So you need to know the chronological order. Satan comes at the sixth trump. Christ doesn't return until the seventh. Do not be deceived. Uh, Theodore from Oklahoma. My question, is this what happens to the ones who were never, never baptized? Let me see here. I've, I'm so thankful for your teachings. I have... I have a family who have passed on and were not baptized and believe in our Heavenly Father. Well, we don't, we don't judge people. We don't, um, we don't know. We leave that to, in God's hands. Like I said earlier in this lecture, the thief, one of the thieves on the cross was, was repentant. And Christ said, this day I will see you in paradise. But he wasn't baptized. So... Don't try to judge them, and quite frankly, those that didn't in the millennium, as we learned in 44, chapter 44, you might even be able to help them. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. it makes His day when you read the letter He sent to you with understanding and clarity. You think about it. Won't you do that? Hey, you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. A lot of good things in store for you. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me good now. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why that is? The reason being because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. This has been a long time I've been promising a children's book. This is a book that will help uh, a parent teach their child exactly what God's Word states. Now, uh, this, this was done by a very good friend and student of this chapel. We have given it, if you would, a binder whereby if there is a page that you feel is too far advanced for your children, then by all means you should remove that particular uh, page. It is done in a material that is even washable and it takes you step by step into instructing a child what does God's Word say. And I, I think you will find it extremely helpful. It is item number 4414.
God's helpline. What are some of the characteristics of God's elect? Personal traits. Think about that. That's what I want you to think about. You want the positive or the negative first? I'll give you the positive first, okay? Positively, I think overwhelmingly we are can do, get it done, no matter what it costs, no matter what it takes, servants of the Lord. On the negative side, we all are extremely impatient. Have you noticed that about God's election? I think that's because we want to get it done for the Lord right now. <laughs> I mean right now. We need to all relax. 